A blessed Mother's Day to everyone. Thanks for sticking around. Usually Mother's Day is a little bit of a low, a low day for this class, because you know the, the guys are running home to, you know, do all the cooking and all that stuff. We got all my work done last night. We're doing pork tenderloin with the orange, uh, orange sauce, green goddess, direct homemade green goddess dressing, salad, out of my garden. Oh, we're going to call it about three or four. Is that a brunch? Three or four in the afternoon? It's a brinner. It's a brinner. That's right. And breakfast to lunch would be brunch. Yeah, brinner. There you go. Lunch and dinner. <laughs> All right, we've got that figured out. I don't know about this subject today, but we've got that figured out. All right, well, um, a few announcements be, um, as we go forward. Tomorrow, next Sunday is uh, the last Sunday where we have this class time. But we will not have a class here. We'll be down in the gathering place for God, the God's Work, Our Hands, Servant Project things like we did when we started the Sunday school year, and it was a big hit, and Kathy Bowman, our community connector, is uh, you know, heading that up, and it'll be an intergenerational event, we want to get the Sunday school kids and adults together, and we'll all be working on this together, so next week, um, you'll want to head down during the, uh, the education time to the gathering place. Also, if you haven't seen it, um, we did a little remodeling in the foyer of the gathering place. You'll want to go down there and see that. We used some money from Darlene Britt's gift and estate. Um, she was just a tremendous person when it comes to hospitality. And so we've made that space uh, more hospitable and a place to gather and for people to talk. And, and, and I'm also very seriously um, conversing about next fall in September, um, having my class back down in the gathering place. Uh, we moved it here because confirmation was so big that they needed that space. That's no longer the case, one. Um, but two, I, I just don't like it that we don't interface with the kids because they're down there and we're down here. And Anyway, so I'm thinking about that uh, for the fall. That's just an FYI. And uh, yeah, so a week, so next Sunday is our last Sunday of our 8 and 11 o'clock worship time, and then the holiday weekend we are going to 8 and 10. So there you go. Um, this is the last of, so this is the last of our session on difficult faith questions. I've gotten a lot of good feedback on these, so I'm glad for that. Remember, they're all recorded, thanks to Greg. Let's give Greg a big hand. Uh, some of them get lost, some of them not so much, uh, but uh, they're there. So if you want to go back and rethink about some things, or if you missed one, they're there on YouTube. So, um, where we've been, just, you know, we've been talking about these questions that sometimes get us stuck, or some people that we know, when it comes to the faith. These are all the things that we've talked about. Um, Great questions. We've tackled some difficult subjects. Uh, last week we talked, or was it last week we talked about other religions and, um, and how we relate to them and the differences between things. I do want to say that um, a couple of people talked to me after class last week. And I, while I was talking about we can connect with other religions, especially around love of neighbor and and I wasn't necessarily saying that we all, all religions have the same drive to care for the poor or care for other people. I wasn't really making a statement about that. I was just trying to say this is where a place where if we're on the same page, you know, like children shouldn't starve to death, you know, we can work together on those. So that's that, that, just a clarification on that. But we've looked at the grace alone, faith alone question. Countercultural worship is Jesus the only way. Um, you know, organized religion.
religion. A lot of people have issues with that, uh, understandably, and we tried to work graciously through that, while at the same time, you know, maybe being challenging on that one as well. We talked about the wrath and punishment stuff in the Bible, and that's a big stumbling block for people. Um, and we've looked at the translations of the Bible, and met, you know, that's a question a lot of people have. So I, it's just been really fun to do this, and um, it's a great setup for our Lay School of Theology. That's my next advertisement. Uh, week, uh, or this upcoming Saturday, Ron Hoyam will be here with us. He's an, he does classes on Bainbridge Island on C.S. Lewis. He's been to, he's gone, gone to the big C.S. Lewis conferences in Europe. Um, he's a terrific person when it comes to C.S. Lewis. So when it comes to difficult faith questions, C.S. Lewis is a really important author. Um, and and you sh it, it's really someone's story you should know. And then, you know, I'd love if this primer that Ron is going to do might encourage you to take, tackle one of his books. Some of them are pretty lofty and challenging. Uh, even if you read Chronicles of Narnia, if you haven't, that's a great place to start. That's, you know, um, so anyway, and I see my, my deal is going um, to play games with me today. Anyway, it might, it might click back in, but uh, yeah, got to figure this out. Um, so while that's thinking, um, my next deal is to talk about the class today. So the question, which like I say, this appeared, um, is, is Christianity stuck with enforcing uh, traditional or um, older uh, gender slash sex roles, men and women, what men and women are supposed to do. Um, so, and why are there so many differences? So, my pastoral reflections on this are simply that, uh, you know, I run into a lot of people who are fully um, embracing what's happened in kind of the Western world around the expansion of leadership opportunities for women, and then they um, look at a lot of Christian churches, and they see, oh, women can't vote in a congregation. Did you know that a lot of congregations, women cannot vote? Yeah? So, um, yes, you found the source. This is good. This is good. I'm glad you looked in there. Um, Congregations, Lutheran yeah. Congregation. Lutheran congregations. So there are, um, let's see. There. Oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> I went back over here and said, okay. <laughs> so there are um, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Uh, I don't know if in their congregations women can vote um, or if there's some restrictions or if that differs from congregation to congregation. Pretty sure the Wisconsin Synod, uh, Christ the King. That school down right here in Silverdale is Wisconsin Synod. I don't think women can vote. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Um, a lot of Southern Baptist churches, women would not be able to vote. Uh, and and th those country, those are very, Southern Baptists are very uh, loosely tied to each other. It's very congregational. So from, sometimes it's denominations, sometimes it's different congregations. And, and it, and it differs from one or the other. So a lot of people, you know, may be fully celebrating um, the opening up of, you know, leadership opportunities of women in our culture, look at the church and they go, what's going on here? Even, maybe, in a congregation like this one that fully embraces the leadership of women, um, you know, what, what, I, it's, what I found is a lot of people just make assumptions about the church. You know, we've talked about this in many other questions already, haven't we? Where, you know, one expression of Christianity thinks this way, so people think that's the way all Christians think, you know. Um, and so, it's, it's interesting. I, I run into people um, uh, that, that just assume that the Christian church is kind of, you know, more a force of 
keeping women in a certain restricted, you know, area, I guess you could say. Um, and so it's a stumbling block for some people. So that's why we're talking about it today. It's, so pastorally, it's also why I left the uh, Missouri Senate. Probably that and the one other issue, a couple other issues. But I grew up in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate. Loved it. Fantastic congregation. Fantastic pastors. Fantastic youth group. I love the Missouri Synod's commitment to the confessions of the Lutheran Church. Um, There's so much of me that is still shaped by my growing up in the Missouri Synod. But in college, when I started to have an inkling of, you know, um, actually it wasn't so much around being a pastor, just as I got more involved in my faith and was growing, um, I started to look at this and I, I go, hmm. And it's, so I, I really went through my own journey of wrestling with the scriptures and reading the scriptures and thinking about the subject. And um, so, so that's one. Two, I've seen how, what a blessing women being in leadership can be in the church and in society in general. Uh, I think... Women have great leadership abilities, and for them to not be able to lead in certain ways because they're a woman, I think is a, is a loss, or could, it can be a loss. I know there's a lot of, um, and this comes out of not a progressive source, but uh, the Global Leadership Conference, uh, one of their featured speakers, uh, they've done studies for businesses, organizations, the blessings that have come with women being able to be in leadership. Here's, I'll, I'll front load this talk, and you've heard me say this before too, um, by my sharing that I believe that all people in Christ Jesus should be able to use their gifts that God has given them. And, and so that's where I come from on this. Um, and I've seen that some women have been given the gift of preaching. And teaching, uh, and I think it's I, I think in my home Missouri Synod congregation, which was rather progressive in the Missouri Synod, it was English district. Um, that district was a non-geographical district because they were churches that were using English before German, <laughs> so they were they were you know pushing the envelope there. Uh, so um, I got some of the best stuff biblically on women being able to be pastors in my district conventions because it was a hot topic back then in that particular district of the Missouri City. Um, why did I go into that? Uh, oh, well, in my home Missouri City congregation, I remember some of the women in the congregation who were just gifted. They only got to teach women. They could not teach a class with men. Oh my gosh. Um, the, and, and that, to a lot of us, just that just seems like, oh my goodness, how archaic, right? Is that to you guys at this ELCA congregation? <laughs> so that's, it, it seems to be the case for me too. Um, and that's why I went into the American Lutheran Church, which had in somewhere around 1970, um, approved the ordination of women, as had the Lutheran Church in America. Um, although I think it was a closer vote in the American Lutheran Church, and I've read, it's, it's been a while, but I've read all the histories about how, how you know, that developed. And then when the ELCA formed as a merger of the LCA and the ALC, that was just a done deal. And that was when I was ordained. Basically, I think I was the first or second class in the ELCA after the merger had happened. So, that's some of my pastoral experiences. It's, it can be a big stumbling block for some people. On the other side, it can be a stumbling block for um, a lot of people who want to take the Bible seriously and the New Testament seriously and what it says, who say, you know, we don't get to just make up whatever we want when it comes to what's right and wrong and what roles men and women have. We've got the scriptures. We say, and in the ELCA's constitution it says this, that the scriptures are the source and norm for faith and life. So, what culture says is not first and foremost.
foremost, what goes, supposedly, in our churches. So, I understand that there are other people who it's a stumbling block that there are congregations like ours that fully embrace the leadership of women. I mean, we have these cross-sections. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, I've been in, I've, there's been stories that I'm aware of where some, someone that belonged to one of the, a church that was more, of a, for the lack of a better word, conservative on this issue of women's leadership were working at a congregation that was open to women's leadership and they had to resign because their other congregation said, you can't be a part of a church that's, you know, heretical and this type of thing. So, what's going on here? This is what we're going to get at in this uh, 45 minutes here of our class. And I hopefully can share some things that will help you wrestle with this question from this angle. This isn't just a class on the ordination of women or the leadership of women, but this is a class on helping people for whom this is a stumbling block. And maybe you're one of those people. Uh, that, so it's a little bit of a different angle at it. Um, and so I hope that I'll do a couple things in this class. I hope that um, I'm going to help you have an understanding for our Wisconsin Synod, Missouri Synod brothers and sisters who are very limiting in the role of women because we can, you know, get our noses up a little bit like those, you know. But if you happen to be a person that says, you know, I don't think women should be in leadership, I hope you will have a greater understanding of what, why this is important and why this is good for the church. I really hope we can, you know, come to some understanding of the other side so that it's less of a stumbling block. Okay, what did I miss as far as my concerns? Summer is secret shame. We, I talked about that. Um, I should note that the same kind of situation exists around issues of sexuality or how we view homosexuality or now this whole spectrum and view of gender as something that is fluid and all these things. A lot of people are adopting these ideas in our culture and they come to the church and they go, hmm, wait a minute. So, so the whole issue of culture versus church and how they connect and influence each other and work is, is, is really what's sitting here before us. I'm not going to, I don't have time to focus in on all of those issues, um, but the, uh, some of what we're going to talk about may apply to those. Um, uh, so I do think there's a big need on um, understanding on all sides, and Luther said about the Eighth Commandment that we should put the actions of others in the kindness of lights, and I wonder if he would go so far on ethical issues to... I don't know if you would on this one, but should we put the beliefs and the ethics of others in the kindness of light? You know? Should we be less judgmental of the people who differ from us? I don't know. I don't know if he would go for that, because I know he he let those who differed in beliefs sometimes have it. So, I don't know. Um, but I just wonder about that. And then the big issue is truth. Who, what sets the standard? Is it the culture? Is it the Bible? Is it the church? Is it tradition? What is it? And that's the other thing that's, that's a big concern. So, before I answer this question, um, you're sitting with someone, and they say, you know, I'm not interested in the church because it's so antiquated in the way it views women, and it's oppressive, and whatnot. What would you say? Boom! You get to work on this now. What would you say? Um, you can just turn and talk to one person, or you can flip around and do a little small group. Groups of three are great.
church is so antiquated when it comes to, you know, what women can do and what they can't do, or what men, you know, what the views of those differences of men and women. Um, what do you say? What do you, what, what do you say? Who wants to, or what did you talk about? Please. I want to, I'd love to hear some from your, from your Somebody. group. Anybody? Uh, right here. Here you go, Dick. Uh, just, oh, there you go. I grew up in a uh, very small town in eastern Washington, and uh, our church was a uh, Lutheran church, and it was the old style of the men sitting on one side and the women on the other. Yes. And the pastor uh, was, a, <laughs> was a very older gentleman, and uh, he ruled. Yeah, ruled without cane. And uh, on a Saturday, yeah. we had to have come and have our memorization done. Sure. Um, <laughs> to show you how old this was, the men were on one side, the women were on the other side, and the kids were with the women. <laughs> and, uh, so the kids had to sit with the, the girls, huh? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, the, the uh, Saturday school uh, confirmation, uh, <clears throat> yeah. I was right beside uh, one of the, <clears throat> I was behind one of the girls. Her dad was the uh, president of the congregation, and she was whispering yeah. uh, to her uh -oh. girlfriend. Now what's coming? And the... Uh, the pastor, Whitrock, uh, Reverend Whitrock said, what are you talking about? You, yeah. you have to, you have to uh, tell us what you memorized. Well, he, she didn't have it memorized. And he grabbed her book and her hit, her, hit her on the head yeah. with the book. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, she started crying and yeah. got up and left. Yeah. And oh, I hate to hear those stories. Yeah. I hate to hear those stories. The old time. Yeah. But there were good stuff about the old time. But those are the t those are tough ones for sure. Um, the the you know I can tell you lots of those that I've heard over the years too. I've had lots of baby boomers my age say that's why they don't go to church anymore. Oh yeah. You know. But you know. Anyway, maybe yeah. Well, most of you know that I wasn't raised in, in the church, or any church. Yeah. I was raised in a military family, so we moved around a bit. And we went to whatever church they were having board base. Yeah. And that could be like anything. Okay. Uh, and, uh, or something that we could walk to close by. Mm -hmm. That's my church experience okay. growing up. So there was no settled church body. Right. With, with anything to be good or bad. And then as a young adult and an adult, I just said, forget it. And I didn't go to any church. Right. <laughs> Put loose and fancy free till my 50s. That's a long time. <laughs> Not that I didn't believe, but I wasn't a believer. Yeah. And there's a difference. Yeah. And so I started attending a Bible study. And I, one or two years in, I got to thinking, this is pretty hypocritical. I'm going to Bible study. I'm not going to church anywhere. <laughs> so maybe I better find something. And some of you may remember my sister-in-law, Esther Anderson, who was a member of this church and started coming the year that you built it and it opened here in this location. And she continued to ask my husband, her brother, and I to come to church with her. And we never did, we never did, we never did. My husband died. And she kept asking me, and I never did, and I never did. And finally, I said, my God, okay, I'll go. <laughs> and I'm still here. So this is my first, really, that I, what I know anything yeah. about church. Right. This is my first experience. Right. And I'm praising God that you're not the Missouri Synod, or I would not have stayed. Yeah. Yeah. So you would have been one of those people who like, I, sorry, I'm not. I'm no, not, I'm an independent woman. I'd say, I am so out of here. Yeah, I mean, right. just forgive okay. me. So, yeah. so what do you say to Billy Jean back then? Um, or maybe, of course, go to an ELCA church. That might, that might be no, one thing you say. <laughs> it worked for you. But it sounds like all the ELCA churches are not the same either. 
That is correct. Some are definitely, um, yeah, boy. <laughs> Thanks, Brent. <laughs> What's that? Oh, over here. Yeah. Uh, I think it's it's interesting that uh, I think the only difference here is whether or not women are permitted to voice their own personal intellect. Because what happens, I think, if you look at many of the great presidents, uh, I could just see Eleanor Roosevelt whispering in uh, sure. Franklin's ear. Yeah. I think the next speech you give ought to say yeah, such and right, such. Right. Yep. And I know if my wife says to me, uh, Roger, yeah. uh, I, think, <laughs> I yeah. think what we need to do with the children is, uh, uh, and then yeah. I do it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so I don't know if you give sermons based on what you're Oh, Sandy has a lot, a lot of good yeah, so, but so it's your, just a matter of expression. Yeah. So your point is, whether it's ELCA or Missouri Synod, women are involved, but in the ELCA it's more open. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, okay, please. Yeah. To somebody that asked that question, I'd say, if you want change, be change. Uh -huh. But growing up, I went to a church where the priest said everything was held by men. Yeah. But there wasn't a person in there that didn't subscribe to the theory. They had the rock cradle. Rules the world. Uh-huh. So it wasn't that women were not influential and important. Oh, no. Even though officially yeah. they could, they were not yet. Yeah. Okay. Good, good. Other things, what 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 do you say? What do you um you know, there there's diversity that I'm gonna actually go to what Brent said. One thing you could say is you know the just like families, churches are very diverse. There's differences. If, if you know, I'm not, I'm not just saying, you know, one size, you know, go, go somewhere else. But, but, but one, I would say to someone as well, you know, there are differences in the church on some of these things. And we differ just like families differ. And, and that doesn't discredit us, you know. And so there are differences. Now, in the ELCA, there are uh, definitely, you know, um, congregations that are more advancing the cause of women than others um, in, in the way they see their role and mission in that regard. So, but, so maybe that's one thing we say to people who are struggling with this. Okay, I see two, Kathy and then Jill. Yeah. Um, I would like to echo that because yeah. there is great diversity within the ELCA. Yes. And yes, you could say go to an ELCA congregation, but depending upon that community yeah. and the folks that the Spirit has brought there. Yeah. Um, you have folks who are very, very welcoming of women in leadership roles and women clergy. You have others who will um, yeah. take that profile when they're looking for a pastor, and if that person's a woman, will not even look at it. Yeah. And so we still, um, yeah. although we have the, um, we, we have the, the um, <laughs> The decision was made, yes, for women years ago to be a part of that in 1970. Um, however, we've, we've come a ways in terms of our welcoming yeah. of that leadership role, but um, we have a ways to go as well. And I was sharing a story real briefly. Um, Please. Um, I was ordained in 1979, so I was part of the early, yes. early part of the pioneer. pioneer women, yes. But there were about 100, a little over 100 women um, who were clergy at that time, female clergy. And in 1990, excuse me, 1980, we moved to Guam um, because HIV was a uh, position at the hospital there in the South Pacific. There was an independent Lutheran churches. There were five of those in the um, in the world at that time that were co-led by ALC, LCA, and Missouri Synod, and they would rotate. And so um, at that time, it happened to be a Missouri Synod pastor. So when we became um, a part of that congregation during our couple years there. Um, great, great person, um, respected him totally, but he was really by the book. Yeah. And so when he would go off island on vacation, I would go up and supply for the Lutheran chaplain at the, the Air Force Base, up in the northern part of Guam, yeah. and that chaplain would come down and lead worship at the, the church, <laughs> the church it, because that's... I could not do it yeah. as a woman. And the only thing I could do was teach vacation Bible school, and so I did that. Um, and that was 1980, okay? So a lot has happened in, sure. uh, since then, sure. but there's still, I think, a ways to go in terms of our total acceptance of all women in leadership and, work, and working together on that. 
you know, thank you so much for that, Kathy, and I want to echo that in, in a couple ways. One, the stumbling block for some might be, you know, because we talk about, well, ELCA officially has ordination of women, but we still have issues. <laughs> and some people might still have a struggle even with an ELCA congregation. Um, uh, and there was a video that was going around quite a while, of, not, know, a few months ago. I think it came out of one of the synods in the South. Um, I'm sure women in this synod would never hear these things. But they had men say things that parishioners had said to the women pastors. It was embarrassing. To, and these weren't 20 years ago. These were today things people people still say, people are saying to women, pastors, you know, about, you know, just the, the assumptions. So, so we've come a long way, we have a lot of long way to go in many respects. Um, um, so that, we need to hold that up. We, it's not like we're in the promised land and, you know, <laughs> you know, this is a process for sure, yeah. Okay, so that's very helpful. Jim, yeah. Yeah, this is back in the, the fourth grade, early 50s, and I was going to uh, full time at the uh, Church of Christ grade school mm -hmm. and church, um, the yeah. old school, United Church of Christ. Yeah. And one of the guys, the heck guy there, approached me and he, he thought I needed to be baptized again and dunked. Yeah. So I went home to mom and I told her what they wanted to do and she sat me down and said, I just want you to know that you don't need to be baptized more than once. You've been baptized. That if you decide that we've helped you, there's nothing wrong with it. So I went back the next day and told this guy, I said, I don't think I'm going to go through with it. And he got mad. Oh, you can't believe oh, I'm really? mad Yeah. Because <laughs> he was going to be able to coerce me into it. And I'm still going to that same school through the seventh grade. We had this, everything was sisters and brothers. We had some wonderful women teachers in that yeah. school. But this one guy, I can't remember his name, but one guy, I don't know what I was doing, something a typical seventh grade student would do to disrupt class. Yes. <laughs> and he wrapped me across the knuckle with his ruler. Mm -hmm. And my mom went out to that school the next day and read him the riot act. Don't you ever, ever do that. Yeah. Wow. yeah. That was the role of women in my life. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks be to God. Yeah. Thanks be to God. It's Mother's Day. We can celebrate that. Up here for Ann, and then uh, then we'll look at we'll look at some texts and and uh, I'm sorry, right, right here. Thanks, Brent. Yep. I just had two quick things. Um, one, I just remember being like 18 and, and the church moving through that discussion, our church in Virginia, and um, just listening to everyone and just being afraid and mm. of, of this. Yes. And uh, just appreciate being here with Pastor Paula and not being afraid. Yeah. Of that. And wow. just seeing the love and grace. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then I just think the whole issue is very um, Pharisee versus Jesus. Mm -hmm. It's all the law, the law, the law. Uh -huh. And where Jesus is the love and the grace uh -huh. that supersedes the law. Yeah. It is the law, but it's the love of us. Uh huh. Okay. So you bring up, uh, yeah, that, that's a very important question. Um, okay, Jane, and then, uh, did I see another? No, sir. Okay, great. Jesus was also the first person to accept women into the church mm -hmm. with a better interview than, than Judaism. Yeah, so, you know, Anne brings this up as, what, what was, and that's a perfect segue, let's, let's talk about Jesus, and let's talk some about some scriptures so that we can, and then maybe this will help us as we, you know, help ourselves and other people as they see the church wrestling with this issue. So, you know, the classic things that Jesus did um, is that he called them they were thought, they were disciples. We hear this mentioned in the New Testament and the Gospels. What, the followers of Jesus included women. <coughs> Just that in Jesus' day was pretty radical. Um, we 
we've got a bunch of Marys, but Mary Magdalene um, was the first to tell the good news. Uh, the women stuck with Jesus all the way, the men ran away. You know, there's, we can talk about some issues like that, but, but um, the Mary Martha story is really important. Remember, Mary sits at Jesus' feet. That's taking the role of a student, taking the posture of a student. Um, from what I understand of Judaism of Jesus' day, that they would, a woman would never get to be in that position. So that's another, it's like, whoa, Jesus seems to really transcend um, a lot of those mores or those, you know, the limiting views of what women could do, be, etc. The other thing that people oftentimes miss on the lips of Jesus is where he talks about divorce. Because the Pharisees, speaking of the Pharisees, the Pharisees wanted to know, hey, is, can we get a divorce? Moses said we could. And Jesus says, he did that for you because of your hardness of heart. Don't think that you can just, you know, and then he makes it very like, no, if you divorce, you're an adulterer type of thing. And, and so obviously people are divorced, and um, when we look at that ethical issue, struggle with that statement. But what we don't want to miss is that the Pharisees thought that a woman was nothing but a piece of property. So we can just write her off. You know, just like a contract. And Jesus says, no, don't you know a man shall leave, they become one flesh? See, Jesus is saying, no, marriage is way more than just what you're making it out to be. And a woman is not just a piece of property. We miss that sometimes in that statement. Um, but, um, Anne, you brought up the law. Um, you know, and it feels like this is kind of pharisaical. When, it, when, when we come at it. And I, I want to affirm that, and then I also want to, though, ask, is when it comes to us in the Christian faith, what are the rules? Are there rules? Is there anything more than just love one another? You know? And, th and this, is, this is where it, it gets interesting. So, let's look at some texts. Huh? Um... I, I'm going to start out with some other texts that are typically not looked at that have been influential for me as I've wrestled with this. Because I, one text that I didn't put up here is in Corinthians where Paul says um, that each of us have a gift for the upbuilding, the edifying of the body of Christ. And oftentimes, in, especially in Corinthians, when Paul is wrestling about whether we can do something or not, he asks the question, is it going to build up the church? Is it going to build up the gospel? Is it going to be a blessing? And, when, and if we just start there, in my view, to, for women who have the gift of leadership and preaching and proclamation and teaching, to be able to fully share those gifts with the body of Christ builds up the church. So, okay, settled. We got it. <laughs> Let's move on. Um, well, there's, there's more to it than that. And so, um, I love this passage in Philippians, uh, where um, this, this word for labor side, side by side is um, synergos, which is where we get the word what? Synergy. Synergy. So, so you've got the Greek word. Um, Paul says, uses this word a lot to talk about his closest partners in ministry. And so here, he, we've got Euodia and um, Zin, to agree in the Lord. So maybe they were having a conflict. Yes, I ask you also, true, compa ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow this is that same word again, um, fellow workers. Paul has no inkling or no problem with holding up women as working side by side, my fellow workers. Um, now, granted, I'm going to, we're not into specifics at this point. Can women read 
read scripture? Can women preach? What were their, maybe they had different roles and all this thing. I understand that, but Paul, many places women are included in this. So, when the ALC and the LCA were, were working on, wow, well, we've seen this cultural change, and now, well, what do we do in the church? They went back to the scriptures, in addition to asking, well, is this going to build up the church? They also said, well, this, this is the source and norm. This is the, what gives us guidance on things, so we need to look at the scriptures. Well, they looked at that passage and others where women are fellow laborers, but they also um, looked at some places where women are mentioned in the New Testament. And so, at the end of Romans, and the, people struggle with this chapter because Paul may not have been there, and so how does he know all these people in Rome? Um, but no, I don't know of any scholars that doubt that this was written by Paul. Um, maybe it was attached to the Romans, or there's explanations on about that. But nonetheless, I've never heard anybody question that. So we've got Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers, there's that word again, in Christ Jesus who risked their necks for my life. Um, so this is a woman, and... Um, Greet my beloved Epinatius, who was the first convert to Christ in Asia. Greet Mary, who was, has worked hard, again, it's the same root, for you. Greet Andronicus and Juania. This is, this is the key, a key um, word. Um, and this is the ESV, by the way, and I'm going to show you it, I think, from... Um, I got it up here and ah, okay, that's all right, but I'll just talk about it. So we talked about this person before. Um, this this name could be a man or a woman. Andronicus is definitely a man. And so notice the ESV translates it as Kin's men and my fellow prisoners. They are well known to the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. Uh, the problem here, and if we looked at the, the New Revised Standard Version, um, they have a little bit different ending because there are some differences in the uh, manuscripts. But nonetheless, here's the deal. Nowhere do we find this name as a man in any Greek literature anywhere. So this is the only place that a man was named Juania, or Juanias. It's like Chris could be a man or a woman, right? If Christopher, man, Christine, woman. It doesn't have the ending, so we don't know. However, in this culture, this person was never, ever a man. It'd be like a boy named Sue type of thing. <laughs> so, Notice, though, what the ESV does with this. They, it says, kinsmen, my family person, so they're assuming this is a man. The New Revised Standard Version, I, I, I thought I had it in my presentation. I was going to use a different one. Let's see, this is Romans 16. What verse is it up there? Three. Three. Um, So, um, the ESV says, my relatives, I'm sorry, the New Revised Standard Version says, my relatives for kinsmen. Because the New Revised Standard Version, along with many church fathers of the past, when I say fathers, church leaders of the past, understood this person to be a woman. And so, the way it reads in the New Revised Standard Version is, um, um, where, where did I go? Yes, here we go. Uh, my relatives who were in prison with me, they are prominent among the apostles. Notice the ESV here says they, um, they are well known to the apostles. Now, that, <laughs> uh, that is a way to recognize 
reconciled that this just couldn't be a woman. Because actually the way it reads and the way the King James Version and every other version I've seen says, just like the New Revised Standard Version says, they are superlative um, or prominent among the apostles. So in essence, Paul, if unless this is the only man who ever had this woman's name in all of Greek culture, and it's not an uncommon name, Unless this person was a man, which like most likely it's not, because it could be a woman, doesn't have the ending or the beginning. Paul seems to say, this person is a family, this is part of my family, they are fellow prisoners, and they are superlative among the apostles. Not they are well known to the apostles. They are superlative, they are prominent among the apostles. Now when you hear it that way, what is Paul saying? Juania is an apostle. <laughs> and he doesn't say, oh, but she doesn't preach, and she doesn't teach, and she doesn't do this, and she doesn't do that. He just puts it out there. He just puts it out there. Yes? You know, going back to my high school Latin, it's being written to the Romans. Yes. So I don't know whether it's similar to that or not. So I just bring this up to say, wow, what about that text? Okay. Um, another important text is this one um, in Pentecost. P this is Peter's sermon, the first sermon of the Christian faith. And he says, in these days, or in those days, I'll pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy, both men and women. So the Pentecostal church, so focused on Pentecost and the giving of the spirit, has had women preachers for a long, long time. Most people don't realize it. Now, they weren't maybe allowed to be in a position of authority, but they got to preach because of this text. What I want, if you were a Missouri Synod congregation, or one of the, you know, the staunch Missouri Synod folks, or by the way, Seventh-day Adventists, I mean, I went, I went online on YouTube, the ordination of women, I just put that in, on, and it's just tons of Seventh-day Adventist stuff about why the ordination of women is ruining the church, and you know, <laughs> just all kinds of stuff. It's like, you know, um, so you can find, I would, I would want you to be able to share and say, you know, there are some texts that are very affirming of women in leadership in the New Testament. You've seen just a few. We could do hours on this. Uh, because sometimes our brothers and sisters in the Wisconsin Synod, the Seventh-day Adventists, the Roman Catholic Church, whatever, feel like we're just capitulating the culture. That's all you're doing. And I, and, and I want to say that may be a part of what we're doing, but... There's ground on the pages of the New Testament. It isn't just, hey, look at Jesus. He was loving, you know, <laughs> so we should, we should do this. No, there's, there's good grounds, to, and this is just the pages of the New Testament. You could go on and look at the role of women and the important leaders in the church. You could go to the Old Testament. And think, you know, there's lots of ways you can come at this. But I guess I just want to make this point, that if you're talking to some, one of your brothers or sisters who are in a church who say, no, the Bible says women have to only do this and they can't do this, and you must not take the scriptures seriously. No, there are scriptures that support where the ELCA is on this. Does that make sense? The, the number one reason that, that I hear as I look at YouTube and as I believe as I listen to someone like the Roman Catholic, the Orthodox Church, we are a minority in the world on this. Although church, the Lutheran Church in Ethiopia and other places uh, ordains women, there are not nearly as many women pastors as there. So, um, is that, well, Jesus had 12 disciples. disciples, and those were the apostles, The even though I've shown you that maybe a woman is, a, a, you know, a superlative among the apostles, as their old Revised Standard Version put it. Um... So that's why Jesus chose men. That's why we
we don't have women today. And, and I think that's a part of the Catholic Church's continual, you know, focus on that. And, you know, I, I, I get it. I understand. Thank you for helping. But my only retort to that is they were all Jewish. Weren't they? For the most part. Maybe there was a Greek in there. I'm not sure. Um, tax collector, but he was a Jewish, you know. So do they have... Did then all priests have to be Jewish? It's just a thought. Of course, the number one text, which also I didn't put up here, is, uh, is Paul's text that in Galatians, there's neither male nor female, slave nor free, Jew nor Greek, we're all one in Christ. Of course, the, you should know, the Missouri Synod folks say that's just spiritually. It doesn't count horizontally. Like the roles we have. God has ordained men to be in this role, women to be in this role. And of course, no one's more important than anybody else. But down here, there's different rules. Of course, I, my retort to that is not my idea. I think it was Stendhal talked about this. But um, said, well, if that's true, then Gentiles, you know, should have the front row and are the, la the back of the church. And Jewish people should have the front of the church. You know, and we should still have slaves. That's fine. You know, yeah, they're slaves, you know, you know, and before God, a slave is no better than a master, but, you know, down here we can still have slaves and masters because it's just a spiritual. So, you know, if you're going to not apply it to one, you got to do it to all, kind of. That's one rhetoric, but I know they have a response to that. Um, but, but I'm preaching to the choir at this point, to some degree. And I think as we talk about this, the other thing, going back to what Kathy shared, we, we've got a long ways to go. <laughs> so I don't want to in any way assume that, oh, wow, we've got the promised land. But we're maybe further along when it comes to this than other churches. But I also want you to un be able to share with someone that, well, here's the deal. The pages of the New Testament do say some things that restrict the role of women. And there are certain Christians who are very devout who want to take God's word seriously, who feel like those settle the matter. Even though I've shown you some other scriptures that I think we have to live with intentions with. Here's some of those scriptures. Timothy. Um, where do we even start? I desire that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness. Okay, with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. That's what my Missouri Synod congregation was pretty sad on it. They were like, well, that settles it right there, doesn't it? That's what they would say. Rather, she is to remain quiet, for Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived. What scripture was Paul reading when he wrote this? But the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Then, yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. See, you guys need to hear this. You're an ELCA congregation. You think, what's wrong with all these other churches that don't have women? Well, this is one reason. They're trying to take this text seriously. So, so what do we do? Yeah, Gloria. And I can't come up with the scripture, but doesn't God say he can use anybody as long as they are preaching Christ? Um, Paul says that in Philippians. I, I, I celebrate that if Christ is proclaimed, that's that's the big thing. Yeah. Um, a couple things to think about on this text, which one, I just want you because this is the ding against the ELCA. You guys don't even study scripture, and how many ELCA people don't even know that this exists? Well, it hasn't been in our liturgy recently. It hasn't been in our liturgy. <laughs> <laughs> Timothy, the letter of Timothy is. Drifted into um, not, not popular because of this text, although there's amazing, wonderful stuff in it. 
Here's one thing to think about. Is this a cultural thing Paul's talking about? If the, well, I just, it's, it's, boy, I'm running, I can't believe I'm out of time already. But um, is this a cultural thing that Paul's talking about? Or, um, you know, I always say to my Missouri folks, by the way, when they quote me this, I say, okay, do your women braid their hair and do they wear gold earrings? Yes. You sh if you're going to take it <coughs> as law, do it all. I remember visiting a Missouri Synod pastor and his wife in San Francisco. I was in a singing group. This was over 30 years ago. And the, his wife was very plainly dressed. There was no, and it just struck me. It's like, wow, it's interesting. And then later I read this and I go, ah, that's why. Because at least he's taking the whole thing. But the Missouri Synod might say, well, that's the cultural thing up there. But then this we're going to employ, you know, full blown. I mean, if you're going to take it all, take it all. Or if you're going to take one part, take it all in this context. Um, you know, uh, there's another side to this. Um, and I read an article on this, and it really was formative for me. Um, when you look at the way Paul in his main letters talk of, talks about women, with the exception of this one little section in 1 Corinthians, which I'll tell you about in a minute, um, very affirming, very, you know, open. What happens between that and now these pastoral epistles where Paul's writing to Timothy telling him how to work in the churches? What happened between these? Why the change? Or what is there a change? Missouri Senate folks would say there was no change. It's just now Paul's being specific to Timothy about how he wants the churches to go. Um, it's very possible that something has happened. One, a lot of scholars think that Timothy was written by a Pauline apostle. You know, somebody writing in Paul's name. Uh, I think, you know, that's a whole other question. It's in the canon of the New Testament. We have to take it seriously um, regardless. I, I do think that um, maybe there's something going on in the churches that engenders this clampdown on women preaching, teaching. Uh, I read an article that really was helpful to me to think about that perhaps um, when you look at those other texts that I showed you and then you look at this one, that maybe there was some heretical stuff being preached and so by some women and Paul just says, boom, no, no speech. Uh, maybe this was just a cultural thing, um, but uh, I mean, I don't have time to try and go to all the different interpretations. My main thing is I want you to see this text, and I want you to know that people, you know, <laughs> now I, I guess I have to say this too, I think the sinfulness of humankind loves power. And men look at this text and go, oh goody. Yeah. I think there's some truth to that. But not all men. And um, not, not at all. But I think this is, this is a part of the picture. Uh, this is a text in Corinthians where Paul says he doesn't want women to speak. Um, you know, Let's see, it's in all church the saints that women should keep silent, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. Um, a couple chapters before this, Paul has talked about why women, women should have a head covering, which is a very bizarre thing, and there's still people wrestling with what that was all about. But it was an instruction, though, on how women should pray in church, and this wasn't just pray silently, but pray aloud. This is in the time when they're speaking in tongues and there's, you know, all these things. And so, two chapters before, he's saying this is how women should do that, and now he's saying I don't want anybody to speak. You know, the, the classic ways that this has been dealt with has been, you know, there was hard, people were hard to hear, and men were, you know, telling women what was said, and there was all this chaos, and so Paul, I don't know if I, I totally buy that. Um, it's just one of the other texts that are there. And what I feel like, I see, is that the New Testament seems to have some diversity of direction on this. 
when I want to take all the texts seriously, not just these, but the other ones I took. So with that, I go, wow, what builds up the church? And, and, you know, and so what I would say to someone who's wrestling with, why is the church so antiquated on some of this stuff? Well, I would say we have some scriptures that dictate what we do and what we don't do, not just culture. And so if maybe you think that's not good, but at least understand where we're coming from. Um, and then, you know, I would want to share with them that, you know, the church is looking at its scripture and going, wow, look at the way Jesus treated. I've talked to them about how Jesus treated women, which is totally undersold in this culture. Um, I would then also, this is what I'd also want to tell them. You know the women's suffrage movement in the United States? Who were running those? That? Were those secular, non-Christian people? No, they were Christian women who looked at the way Jesus treated women. And they were driven by that. By the way, you can say the same thing about the civil rights movement. So, I mean, I, I, get, I get a little frustrated when I hear all this celebration of the civil rights movement totally severed from any connection to the church. This was a church movement. The slaves were given the Bible, and they read about how God delivered slaves out of Egypt, and they sang those Negro spirituals. Where did that, their impulse, you know, um, what's the great person with the, the railroad down um, Thank you, Harriet Tubman. I mean, this is a Christian woman. This is, she is driven by the scriptures. So if, if people say to you, you know, the church is so antiquated and so and, and, and prejudicial and this and that, and say, you know, it's a family. And there's differences and the problems and the church is broken. But look at, let's, at least if we're going to say this is the bad stuff, look at the good stuff. The civil rights was a Christian movement. It was. And the suffragist movement of the United States came out of the church. I'm not saying it's just exclusively that. But it came out of the church. It came out of the women who saw the way Jesus treated women on the page of the New Testament and said, wait a minute. You know, is this right that then we are limited in this way? Um, so I think that's something I'd want to say to people. Um, I'd want to say, you know, it's, it's different and we're out of time. So, um, I hope this is helpful for you in wrestling with this difficult faith question. Um, I hope um, if you want, uh, I can get you some more resources if you want to read more on these different passages. But I hope you'll see that uh, why um, there's some differences. We've got to quit. Um, God's work our hands next week, as I explained at the beginning of the class. Don't miss it. And thank you for a great program here and a great uh, adult ed this, uh, this whole program here. So God bless you for your passion.